to Marin Poets Live. I'm Neshama Franklin. I work at the Fairfax Library, and I love poetry. So it is a special pleasure for me to share this opportunity to introduce you to poets from our county in the flesh, as it were, as they read and discuss their work. Monthly tapings will be broadcast on Marin TV and then become part of a special page on our website, along with biographies of the poets and links to our collection. This is a partnership with the Marin Poetry Center. A common thread throughout the programs will be discovering how living in Marin has influenced their poetry. Those of you who already love poetry will appreciate this direct transmission from the poet to the listener, you. Those who might think of poetry as esoteric or abstract will discover how it can sing when read aloud. In this program, we feature Sharon Fain and Joe Zaccardi, and welcome, Sharon. Oh, thank you. It's delightful to be here. That's wonderful. Well, I always like to plunge right in with a poem. Well, this is a Marin poem, um, and it also has to do with how I find poems, because it's about walking. For weeks after the diagnosis, I walk beside water, muscles and joints on autopilot, nothing at all required from the mind, which is learning to let go its harried now, now, now. Ahead of me, women pushing strollers, old men in running shorts, each person's body exquisite, imperfect, we are witnesses for one another, partners in the enterprise of being alive exactly here, where snowy egrets work the darkness between stones and herring mill in the shallows. Most days the sea does no more than stir pebbles on a narrow beach. But the first morning after a storm, we're faced with wreckage, masts, half hauls, splintered decks, boats torn loose from moorings west of here in Sausalito. The little shiver of gratitude, not me, at least not today. Mm. Boy, does that do it with the dread first line, that kind of thunk. <laughs> and then again, I'm always amazed at how a poem can move from the very specific to the very huge and back all in two or three lines. That, so. That's Blackie's Pasture Bike Path, and it amazes me. Five or six times a year, big sailboats will wash up on this rocks mm -hmm. there. It's, it's right, and in our lives as well. And in our lives as well. Yes, yeah. that was a beauty. Yeah. I, I want another. Okay. <laughs> I'm going fast, but I want another. Um, and this is sort of related to the same topic. Poison. Magritte painted a cloud pushing in through someone's front door. A seaside cloud, solid as cotton batting, but in miniature. Then he painted the wooden door's desire to be sky. He called that scene poison, believing the impossible is more than most people are able to bear. But it delights us. Every exquisitely misplaced moon, every torso, half flesh, half oak, every defeat of gravity delights us. The gallery is crowded. A woman, nearly bald, leans forward to see the cloud. Though it wasn't expected to work, she had taken the poison they offered. What could feel more impossible than getting herself back after so long, perhaps we are born for this, to be astonished, then go on. Oh, I love that. And I think of the poison, I know I, I get the, of course, the chemo reference, but I also think of it as homeopathy 
homeopathic poison and, and possibly poetry is like that for us, you know, it gives us the little taste of eternity, of fear made workable, you know, all those oh, junctures. <laughs> so um, we'll back off a little and tell me how you came to, to when did you know you were a poet? Over the age of 50, which kind of <laughs> put me at a big disadvantage, I, uh, my, my field is developmental psychology and counseling. I taught at City College for over 30 years. And there was a year uh, in the early 90s when they had all this staff development money they had to either spend or give back to the state. So there was great fervor. Everybody was encouraged uh, during the summers off to go out and get educated <laughs> in something different. So I took a, a writing class at, at Berkeley, and it, it, hap it was a general writing class because I had been writing proposals and reports, and I thought, well, you know, I'll work on this. The teacher was a poet, Clive Matson. And we did one little dabble in poetry in the course of um, the nine weeks. And he spoke to me afterwards and said, have you ever thought about writing poetry? Wow. And, uh, and then I studied with a series. I kind of got excited about the idea, studied with a series of local teachers in workshops. I have no... Um, academic background in poetry um, and uh, of course I in my undergraduate years I took English classes and you know was aware of uh, Whitman and Dickinson and so forth yeah. but um, but I and I knew a little bit about the modernists but about contemporary poetry I knew nothing when I started I think so, that's great Actually, I think of uh, academia as a, can be a slog um, because you're f trying to fit it into the canon or yeah. whatever that stuff is. And so you, you're a tabula rasa with 50 years of experience and, and, and perception to come to it. So it's kind of like a compressed and then open experience. Yeah. That's, that's the way I look at what you've been doing. Well, definitely the themes I started working with were a mature person's mm -hmm. themes of aging and illness. And, and my earliest poems had to do with suddenly becoming an empty nester. Ah. My youngest child going away to college and, and uh, uh, that was a, probably a big impetus because all of a sudden I had time. Oh yes, <laughs> at yes. time and and missed the kids a lot. So mm. yeah, that's so the yearning. Yeah, uh, that's beautiful and yeah. and the big hole that yeah. needs to be filled. Right. Um, is there one in there that addresses that? Perhaps? Actually, there is. Um, Am I getting you out of sequence? You, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> that does not matter. Um, and this is the kind of poem that a great many middle-aged uh, women poets write because it, it is about Demeter and Persephone. Mm. And after I wrote this poem, uh, I did an online search and discovered that so many people had written powerfully about this situation. Demeter in the suburbs. One, it wasn't as if a meadow opened, violence of thrown soil and uprooted plants, the smoky entrance suddenly there. It was what we did, she and I, sitting with lists of questions commonly found on the SAT, the opposite of redundant, the specific gravity of salt, choosing sheets for the dorm room, single, extra long, black to stand out in the wash, the letters of admission like diplomas, embossed seal, a ring of Latin, the end arriving first, 
Of course I willed her to go. No dark chariot was needed, no trampled petals. Two. And sex, in truth, plays no part here. We're permissive beneath our laurel trees. My grief has nothing to do with how she might use her body, but everything to do with wanting her bodily presence, reading cookbooks aloud, eating my lemon chicken. Hades' crime, I see now, was not theft or seduction, but making a girl invisible, face and breath no more than a rumor, drifting up through layers of granite, shale, sand. Mm. They, I, I think I've had definitely one Demeter and Persephone poem in that very chair and possibly two, and that is exquisite. Yeah. And what you did is you, you celebrated the ache and you brought her yeah. there. By erasing yeah. her, you brought her there. Yeah. It's so paradoxical. Yeah. It's just beautiful. So this girl who went off to college, um, I bet she's older now. She is 42 years old okay. now. Okay, <laughs> and, and um, is she the one who's produced the grandchild or the she, grandchildren? She or? is the one oh. who, is who has three children. Wow. Uh, one of uh, whom was adopted in Africa and two of whom were born in Marin General Hospital. Wow. And I have a poem about that. I if, would love to hear it. you would like oh, me yes. to share it. I, um, my daughter's been working in third world countries um, for about 12 or 13 years, uh -huh. and I get to go and stay with her for big chunks of time. Yeah, this is going to be the last poem. Okay. Okay. Angola, 2002. One, I watched children in the streets near my daughter's flat and marveled at my inability to make things even the slightest bit better for them. Successful escapees from war, they foraged beneath market stalls for fruit and slivers of roasted meat then slept side by side in stairwells or close to trash fires in vacant lots. Now peace had come. They wanted to go home, washed their shirts beneath spigots in the municipal garden where Cape Jasmine and hibiscus bloomed. I was used to being necessary, but in that country of the young, that country of few survivors, I was old and suspect, walking the cracked pavement, graffiti scrawled in Portuguese or Umbundu, mysterious as markings on the moon. Two, my daughter showed me her statistics malaria, polio, landmines, dysentery. We were out on the Ilha at Club Miami, owned as so many things seem to be by relatives of the country's president. 10 US dollars to use a beach chair, the customers mainly locals, but a few aid workers and some oil rig guys down from Cabinda, lifting glasses of castle lager, talking price per barrel. It was the year my grandchild was born, grew chubby and thrived in love with sand, its grittiness against damp skin. My daughter drank lemonada, sighed. Gulls strutted along the seawalls, pulling tiny crabs from beneath stones. Then, as if she had decided something, the baby, for the first time, crawled away from us, moving fast toward the water. She would not be deterred. I jumped 
and danced and waved my arms back and forth in front of her, laughed when she laughed, made the sea unreachable. That was something I could do. And that is something that you did. I want much more time with you, but we have to stop. Thank you so much, oh, Sharon. Oh, well, it Thames. has been a delight. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Welcome, Joe Zaccardi, who is, as of April, Marin's Poet Laureate. Pretty nifty. Very nifty. Thank you, Michelle. Um, in like three sentences, how did this happen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was urged by friends to throw my hat in the ring, and I only was convinced because I thought I wouldn't get it. Oh. And so when I got the call, I was like, this has got to be a mistake. <laughs> That's the beautiful, the let go <laughs> makes the space. Yeah. So now let us plunge right into a poem. Absolutely. And I have a poem about Marin in this book. Okay. Uh, and uh, in the news lately, there's been uh, a lot of talk about the oyster farmers out in oh, yes. Point Reyes Station area. And this poem takes place out there. Uh -huh. So it was kind of an interesting thing. And, and uh, the poem actually uh, gives all the facts, so I won't. No need. No need to go into those. And it's titled, How a Day is Spent. Marshall is a place, not Johnny Law, the long arm, and it's east not west of Tamales Bay, which feeds in and out from the Pacific. And there is a place there I go to get oysters, family run, open Friday through Sunday. They take only cash and check. So you know, the line at the door starts at 11 a.m., the catch hauled to the cleaning sinks in the kitchen around the same time. I learned after going there on and off for 19 years, maybe closer to 20, that the seeds for the bivalves are shipped from Japan each season because they need warmth to incubate. Then they need the constant flow of fresh and cold to grow. I always tip big here and round up high, sometimes have an iced anchor steam beer, maybe a mile walk back out and back to the full parking lot, maybe strike up a conversation because talk is a way to share. Because the days go from short to long and back, I fast for the rest of the day, as eating is a kind of religion without name. Mm, that's lovely. And I love the idea of how the seeds of the oysters grow, and I think of that as <clears throat> seeds of creativity, which I bet you did too, yeah, exactly. <laughs> along the way. So do you, do, are you drawn to West Marin a lot? Or are you even? Um, you know, I am in the sense that anytime someone comes to visit from out of town, it's the first place I take them. Ah, that's our jewel, as Yes, I live in Fairfax, and that's, uh -huh. that's pretty west. You know? mm -hmm. And there's all those little towns going out there. It's wonderful. That's beautiful. Yeah. How about another poem? Sure. I'm going to uh, switch to another part of the world. Uh, uh, this, is, this takes place in Way, which is, in, is in what was in South Vietnam, at the border of North Vietnam. And... Um, I was stationed there for about three months in the January of 1968, so this was just before the Tet Offensive. Mm. And it's called, There is a River. There is a river near Way called Perfume. Its water is red, amber during the monsoons. There is a factory that processes rubber, trees with thick green leaves, barks bleeding white, Birds come from around the world to drink from the river. I used to watch them hop, dip their heads, then leap up into air, folding their legs back like a jet's wheels, like corsairs. And there is someone named Du Tan Mai who once took me into her house, fed me rice with her fingers, while I tilted my head back and chewed. She showed me her white jade Buddhas and said, I should listen to the stars out in her small garden because they can sing. There was a cot to lie upon, around us bamboo and boxes of lilies, some burnt orange, some white, some darker, 
and one that was white with green pistols. There was fragrance and river sound. I know we both cried. And if either of us slept, it was pretend. Oh, that's so amazing. Now, did you see action, the horrible action? 98.9% um, no. <sighs> so I was really lucky in that yes. respect. Um, but somehow it's all around the beauty of this poem. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and the business of perfume and rubber in yes. right pushing yes. up against each other is just amazing. Yeah. And that's the, um, that's the French tire company. It's still there, mm. making tires out of rubber. Yes. Um, and it's literally, it's just called perfume. It's actually in English there. Ah. It's called perfume. That's, that's astonishing. Wonderful. So, um, Marin to Vietnam, to where else? To where else? Have you well, been? Well, I was, I was discharged at uh, Treasure Island and when I saw the Bay Area mm -hmm. from that little island, which I was not allowed to leave. Ah. And um, so I went back home to New Jersey for a while. Ah. And uh, that was in 1970. And <clears throat> um, they had been doing urban renewal in Newark, New Jersey, which is where I was born. And um, they ran out of money after they knocked everything down. <laughs> So it looked like this war-torn place, and it was just awful. It's since repaired itself. But from the war to the war. From the war to the war. Yeah. And so I, I said to my parents, I, I said, I think I'm going to go out west for a while. And <sighs> they said, when will you be back? I said, I'm sure much sooner than four years. Mm. And, uh, but I really never came back. I mean, I went for visits, but I stayed, uh, lived in San Francisco for quite a while, and then finally moved to Marin in 1987. So you know your compass was pointed. That's right. That's and you right. felt that you felt that you had arrived when you came. Right. I exactly. Bet. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm all, read, read another poem, and then we'll find out more about okay um, where these come from. Yeah. Let's see. I'm going to read. This is uh, titled "Lipo and the Student," and I will just mention that Lipo is one of the most famous poets of the Tang Dynasty. This is from about, he was born in 1701 and uh, died in 1762, we think. And back then, um, the great poets would have students and they would, um, they would sort of start a poem for them and let them finish it. Uh -huh. And then they would sign it, their name, <laughs> if they liked it. <laughs> and so some of Li Poem's poems are not his, but her student, his students. And this happened in the French, uh, French Impressionist paintings where sometimes the Impressionists would start it and say, well, you know, finish those dots for me, you know, and then put their name on it. Mm -hmm. you know. But then these students would go on to be great, great artists and great poets. Yeah. Lipo and the student. He unfurls a scroll of rice paper, snatches up a brush, dips it into fresh ink, scrawls seven characters. His student throws a handful of sand over the wet surface of the poem, blows off the loose grains, reads aloud, then looks up and around at the way the red delta stretches flat. How a lone boatman stands in the stern, swaying an oar twice his height. How three heron touch their wings to water and dragonflies hover in the rushes. How a stick walker practices among the brown humpbacks of water bison and beyond, a circle of huts in the haze of wood smoke. Now, Li Po says to his student, take this poem, throw it into a stream, and watch it sail away. Mm. I can see why you're the poet laureate, because you bring <laughs> that thread of tradition all the way through right where you are. Now, have you been where Li Po lives, or only in your heart? I I've been to China. Ah, yes. yeah. uh -huh. um, you li you li does, tra does travel come for, from curiosity, or from necessity, or from both? Um, well, I think uh, when I was in Vietnam, I just got enchanted with the East. And ah. so after I got out of Vietnam, I went and, and China opened their doors, I wanted to visit. Yeah. And um, I especially liked, uh, you know, most of the, many of the poems that survived were etched in stone. Ooh. And, and, they were, and so people could make impressions, so they didn't disappear. So mm. there are a lot of poems that have survived because of that. Right. Reason. God, we've gone from etching in stone to poems on the cloud yeah. now. <laughs> That's right. Um, you're youngish, young, younger than most of the poets 
who are often retired and therefore can devote themselves to poetry. You have a day job? Well, no. Dare I ask?